But if you invest in people in deep and meaningful ways, they are highly valuable to you in the future, very fungible and flexible to meet the needs of the organization. So it's honestly not the most innovative thing that's come around in the past few years that makes me excited and see the DOD as a model. It is its intentional talent development efforts year after year after year after year that raises up in a high turnover workforce the skills that are needed not just to operationalize or to operate at a positive format, to, but to be the best in the world. Hello and welcome to the Making Better podcast, where we talk about making individuals, teams, and organizations better. My name is Matt Jertsen, the founder of Better Everyday Studios, and today we have the pleasure of talking with Matthew Daniel. Now, I've been following Matthew for quite a while on LinkedIn and various podcast appearances, and I'm really excited to talk to him today because he has had an incredibly varied career. He started out in consulting and worked internally at some major companies. He started his own consulting company, and now he is the senior principal of talent strategy at Guild. So he's gotten to work with everything from Fortune 500 companies to extremely small startups. And now he's actually also doing some work for the DOD, which is, you know, after all, one of the largest organizations on the planet. That's what we spent a good deal of time talking about today. So I think we really get a lot out of the discussion. I'm sure you will too. So let's dive in talking to Matthew Daniel. Matthew, welcome to the Making Better podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you on that we finally connected. I think I had, I'd, you know, been seeing you. I had been the lurker on LinkedIn watching you and you on other podcasts and your postings for so long. And then we finally got connected. So I'm I'm really glad to have you on today. Um, you know, I did kind of a brief intro of you going into it, but you've had such a varied career. Um, you've seen so many things. I'd love if you could give the audience just kind of a quick rundown of, of the experiences that you've had, and or maybe even just like if there is a particular experience that stands out to you, I'd love to I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give this like quick synopsis of seven or eight years growing up in the learning and talent space with GP Strategies, which gave me the chance to like go all over. I mean, Homeland Security, DOD, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, like big industry, uh, smaller companies that I got to work with growing up in the field of talent development from learning ops through facilitation, instructional design. All of that's been fun. Like a couple of years in-house at Capital One, which was, I love consulting, but to, to have to live with your own recommendations, <laughs> which was part of the reason that I went into uh, Capital One. And then um, the past three and a half years at Guild have been so formational. I guess it, it feels like a cherry on top. I, I haven't had enough of a career to feel like it's a pinnacle. And yet I still feel like... Uh, it feels the pinnacle. I'll say a couple, when you think about like impactful experiences, I'll do like a fast forward version, which is as I was exiting GP strategies, um, GP strategies is kind of an engine behind so much of the learning and development world yeah. that folks don't know. Um, if, if you're stateside, GP has had a phenomenal impact. And so as I was leaving, I was writing my exit email and it dawned on me of like, if you, in your normal day, and this goes to like the field of talent development, all the places that we touch and work and have uh, an impact. And so as I was reflecting on my time there, I was writing and I, I just said, you know, when you turned on your light switch this morning, the power came on because of a power plant that GP Strategies uh, brought online. And when you sleep in your bed tonight peacefully, it will be under the blanket of mm. DOD contracts that like GP Strategies has done a lot of training on. Yeah, when yeah. you take medicine, uh, your pharma, when you put your shoes on uh, with Nike shoes, if you like through the course of your day, there's so many pieces and I just saw the impact. And so that was a really formational moment for me. That's formational incredible. moment at Capital One was uh, this moment of the CEO or CEO Rich Fairbank coming and saying, look, look, we've got to make a, we've got to go through a digital transformation. And everybody kind of said, ah, I'm not sure what that means. And I don't know, I want to be in the middle of it. And I think that moment where I raised my hand, I went to our CLO at the time and said, 
I think we should define what digital literacy means, digital fluency means, and we should drive that in the enterprise. And she kind of said, no thanks. But that <laughs> seems really political and nobody here knows what it means. Like, let's not step off in the middle of it. And I thought that was a moment that we could drive meaning and change the mm -hmm. business. And I was just young enough to like um, be so energized by the chaos that that was going to uh, create that I decided to lean into it. That was a really impactful experience. I think most of all, like if I bottom line it, um, is the most impactful part of this entire journey has been, has been my time at Guild. And I think it's because if you had asked 21 year old Matthew right out of college, like, why do you work in um, training? At that point in time, I wasn't in learning. I wasn't talent sure. development. It was sure. hard. It was training, front of room training. Yeah. Um, and so why do you work in training? And the thought that I had, we were training first responders on WMD detection. And like what I thought was, um, you know, as these firefighters earned more credentials, um, more certifications, it made, it could make a difference in their pay. It, it was literally something you would get paid more for. And, um, and so what I thought to myself is when we do an excellent job at delivering this learning, people make more money. And when people make more money, they can invest in their kids to go to better schools. Most of us as, as, that are parents are thinking, yes. how do we make the world better for our kids? And so what I, I thought then is like L&D, this field of learning and talent development is can have a legacy of impacts. It's not even just the person in the room or taking the training, the learning, the person that you're developing talent development for. It's actually this really big um, systemic creator of value in the world to the business, to society, to individuals and to their families. And the idea that I could always have that impact was something I always wanted. And I feel like I did throughout so much of my early learning career, Guild has let me put like such a fine point on that because nice. what we do is think about specifically education and credentials. Mm -hmm. And that is really, I don't have to suppose that people make more money than that. There's a lot of data around it. And so what I see is like the economic mobility that comes out of access to credentials and talent development that really makes me say, you know, for the rest of my life, I want to be in a space where I am both building businesses and executing on strategy, but I'm doing it in a way that like leaves the world better. And for me, I think finding Guild at this intersection of equity, talent development, uh, um, economic mobility really made me um, excited and, and kind of changed the trajectory of where I imagine I'll be from this point forward. That's that's awesome. It's so great when because I, I do unfortunately think a lot of learning people since it is kind of a thing that you just like fall into very often or show up in it. it there's not always opportunities to think about the impact that we can have in that way and kind of yeah. the follow on impact. We talk a lot about impact to the business and that's definitely something that we drive and, and focus on. But that Im real impact on people, you know, all, I, I was so lucky in that since I started uh, in the military and flying. I'll never forget a day when I was, I, I bring this up a lot in speeches where um, the day that Soli Solenberger landed on the Hudson River yeah. you know, and saved all yeah. those people. I was at the Air Education and Training Command Annual Symposium in San Antonio. So that was happening same weekend. And uh, of course, so that happens in the whole rest of the conference, every pilot's saying like, oh, I could oh have goodness. done that. Oh, if well, you right. know, like, but then at the end of the conference, when um, the commander of Air Education Training Command gave his keynote speech, he just stood up there and said, you know, he's like, this is amazing. This is, you know, it saved all these lives. I just want you all to remember that his journey started with us because mm. Soli had been an, a pilot in the U.S. Air Force. So literally yeah. you trace it back 30, 35 years. He had been one of our students. Yeah. You know, and so and it was just such an impactful like, oh, that's what we're doing. That's right. You know, and um, yeah, and it's not just that they can, it, yes, people are getting skilled today and they can do their job better and they get paid, but man, like drawing that line to, they can have families that are flourishing and invested in their kids. Like that's, yeah. that's a true impact.
Well, and I think like if I go back in my career, the moment that everything changed for me is I was in a learning ops role, which is a fancy way of saying we made copies of training materials. That was my <laughs> real first job in yeah. home, like a Homeland Security contract. And my supervisor at the time came over and tapped me. I had driven a lot of efficiency into the team and we had some slack capacity. And she came over and she said, hey, we're doing this 40 hour train the trainer on instructional systems and tools. Would you want to be a part of that? Well, sh sure. And I think what happened in that moment is I didn't just go to a 40 hour like boot camp on instructional um, tools and technology. It absolutely, absolutely changed the trajectory of my life because what I started to unpack was the science behind learning, mm -hmm. not just, I had been doing leadership development for many years through church. And then when I realized there was actually a science behind it, like my mind just opened up. I, you yeah. know, there weren't many people in instructional systems, in, you know, instructional technologies programs at that point in time, especially not in rural Arkansas where I grew up. Yeah. And so that 40 hour boot camp changed everything for me about the entire trajectory of the rest of my career. And I'm so grateful for moments like that that are so unsuspecting and yet are so formational in who you become in time because it just leapfrogs one place to another to another to another and yeah, yeah. anyway it's been a fun it's been a fun journey and i am uh keenly aware of how grateful uh, how grateful i should be for the people who have given me opportunities to go places see things be a part of things that have really formed little bits of how i think about our field and the opportunities we have to make an impact yeah absolutely that's awesome well Thank you for that. And I know I know you just kind of you kind of referred to Guild as the cherry on top with your career. But I know for, for me, there, there's one specific thing that you're working on right now that I am really yeah. interested in that I want to talk to you about, because as I mentioned, you know, I spent my early career in the military. Um, I was an executive officer for a while. And so I spent a lot of time looking at performance reports. I went to promotion boards, gave presentations to folks on how to get promoted and how to advance your career. Um, and now you find yourself doing some work with the DOD, um, kind of talking about performance management. Um, how did, and, and, and talent development, uh, how did you get, how, how did that come about? Yeah. Um... I, I will say I am still shocked to be there and be a part of it. Like I would love to uh, show up with such confidence and swagger that I always knew that's the kind of opportunity I'd have, <laughs> but I did not think that. Um, yeah, so I do, I get to serve on the uh, talent management, diversity and culture subcommittee of the Defense Business Board. And for those who don't know what that is, it's an advisory group that of outside uh, experts in our field who um, serve as advisors to the Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Defense. And uh, I'm just gonna do the caveat now, because this is important. I go through my own ethics training as part Absolutely. of participating in the DOD. I am not speaking on behalf of the DOD or the DPB. I'm just Matthew speaking on behalf of Matthew. Um, that journey to become um, um, a member of that subcommittee has been just astounding. I essentially a part of my role at Guild is thought leadership. It's to uh, do deep research on topics and write a lot about those, speak about those. And so when I joined Guild back in 2020, uh, I had already written a couple of things for uh, publications like Chief Learning Officer or Chief Town Development Officers uh, TD. Um, and so I had started generating a lot on the field of career mobility of of uh, folks being able to, you know, consume learning and build new skills and then uh, internally transfer to bigger jobs and opportunities. And so I've written, um, I've recorded a number of podcasts and have written a number of things. The DOD, the, the members of the Defense Business Board had actually started a study on talent management uh, philosophies and specifically on mobility. And they uncovered a couple of my articles uh, I got an email that purported to be from the Pentagon. Literally, it said, I think it was like from the opposite office of the Secretary of Defense. Oh, is, is this spam? I, and, need to, I need to check uh, on I, this. hundred <laughs> percent. Like I forwarded on to InfoSec and was like, hey, somebody's <laughs> spamming me. And they came back and were like, no, that's legit. Uh, so anyway, I ended up uh, sitting down with them for an interview as a part of one of their studies. And after that study was over, um, I got a, 
a phone call from the the kind of director that leads all of that work and asked if I wanted to join. They were blowing out, adding a number of additional um, members to that subcommittee and asked if I would join. I promptly responded, uh, did you mean to keep, call Josh Burson? Like, who else were you trying to call? I don't <laughs> yeah, think you yeah. meant to call me. Um, and and yet uh, she insisted. And I said, look, if you're going to give me the opportunity, I don't know that I have enough value to add. But look, if you're going to call me, I'm going to take the opportunity. Uh, I get to go to the Pentagon once a quarter and sit down with a number of leaders, almost always the deputy secretary, sometimes the secretary of defense. Um, there are uh, probably about 25 of us across the three subcommittees. And we get to hear about the latest and greatest of what's happening in the DOD. And then uh, we are asked to take on studies. We're tasked to take on studies um, in certain areas that um, the secretary, or often the deputy secretary, are wanting to go much deeper into. And um, we set about doing benchmark researching of what's happening in the industry, what's happening inside the DOD. We get to, um, we're governed by a series of uh, pretty incredible laws that exist about sunshine in government, which I think is phenomenal, where we get to ask questions, but maintain, uh, you know, the um, privacy of the people who are responding to us. And we write up these summaries and uh, get to take them around to different um, members, sometimes of the media, but definitely to members, uh, uh, to employees at the Pentagon, both on the civilian and military side and provide advice from what we see in the industry. A lot of times they take up those uh, those issues that we throw out there. We, we literally have scorecards where we look at uh, over the past couple studies, how are those things being adopted? What is, what isn't, what are, what did we learn through it? So that's a whole lot of fun and something that I really enjoy doing and learning about. I, I said it like my second contract right out of college, my, um, that first and second contract, one was Homeland Security, one was DOD. It was on a DOD installation in rural yeah. Arkansas where I lived, which was like, it is the major employer in the area. And, um, and so starting my career there, I told you a little bit of the story. It wasn't a great start for me. I wasn't a good <laughs> um, match for the pace. I, yeah. I wanted to run at a quicker pace, pace than my um, cohort at the DOD. And so it didn't feel like a good fit then. And now it's in a, I get to uh, advise at a completely different level. It's a whole lot of fun to get to be a part of. I'm, it's, it is an honor as an American citizen to be able to use my experiences and bring that to the DOD and then frankly to learn a lot from what's happening in the DOD and bring that back out to private industry. Yeah, and I think, you know, for people who aren't aware, there really are a lot of, you know, the, the military as a whole from my experience, you know, I'm I'm still in the reserves. It's very it, they're very keen on getting outside input right now. It might not always be the yeah. easiest. It might not, you know, it might be a little bit tedious to try to work with some work in different programs, but they are definitely trying to bring in that outside information, um, get new points of view. I'm interested, yeah. you mentioned, you know, you're kind of tasked through these different studies. What, is, what does that mean? Are you conducting surveys or interviews or are you just doing research and summarizing it? What What is that? Yeah, all of the above actually. Wow. So uh, the, the, study, uh, um, the study that we're working on now, it's actually published um, to the website, it is focused on culture, culture of efficiency, culture in the DOD, mm. um, and culture of innovation in particular. Um, the one we just wrapped up was on talent acquisition, was on recruiting. And so for these, what we tend to do is uh, go do, sometimes we'll do focus groups. Uh, this most recent say we did focus groups with a number of service members mm. and civilians working in uh, the different components. Um, uh, sometimes we'll do big surveys where we'll send out a set of a couple dozen questions and ask the services to respond. We always do interviews. So we always do one-on-one -on -one interviews with a number of folks. And there are a handful of us from the committee who will uh, join uh, the different calls. Uh, even the subcommittees themselves are made up of both um, those of us who come from like never having served civilians. And then you have, uh, I'm on a subcommittee with someone like uh, General Larry Spencer. Uh, and others who have military experience and uh, private sector experience. And so we'll ask questions. We tend to also, whenever you do have an email coming from the Pentagon, you can reach out to big names. And so we yeah. interview CEOs, CHROs, CLOs from the country's biggest em employers. And so we get this like 
you know, leadership and brass of DOD, a frontline employee of DOD, uh, industry leaders, and then usually quite a bit of lit review or kind of uh, desk research on those topics and really pull together what are in every one of these studies, what we're asked to do is outline uh, essentially our findings. What do we find? Uh, both inside the department, outside the department, and then what are our recommendations and a roadmap of how we think those things need to evolve uh, over coming months and years. That's awesome. When So in this capacity, as you've been doing this, and whether these are things that you've been researching or things that you've been seeing other people bring bring in, what are what are kind of the biggest surprises? You know, as somebody that's been outside mm. of the military for your entire life, and now you're getting a little bit of a peek behind the curtain, kind of, yeah. What what surprised you about talent development in the DoD? Yeah. Ooh, um, <laughs> I think here's here is it's as good and as bad as you imagine. That's yeah. what is surprising. I I I think what I because of my time working near the DoD my perception of the pace of innovation and some of those things was not, I didn't have the uh, most positive of views. And I think the deeper I get into it, the greater my respect grows for the level of innovation that I see inside the DOD. I think one of the things that is so interesting about the DOD, it is, it is the largest uh, workforce in the world. Yeah. And it is uh, massively complicated. Uh, it has the biggest footprint of any workforce in the world. It has the most jobs and occupations of any workforce in the world. There is literally, you want the job, it exists inside the DOD, if you can think of a job. So ultimately, I think what is interesting for as big and hairy and complicated as that can be, there are also these pockets of innovation that are inspiring and energizing and make you appreciate deeply the work of, of the men and women, both in uniform and civilians who um, work so hard to make sure that we don't go to war again, right? That's, that is ultimately what they're trying to accomplish. And so I think, and, and that we are ready in case we have to. And so when I think about this workforce, I am just constantly amazed at some of these pockets of ingenuity and innovation that I see happening. On the negative side, I'm surprised at how little that gets around. I think whenever you see so many good things inside the department, the fact that those aren't always connected throughout the department is disappointing, but also not surprising. If you worked in a Fortune 100, you'll find some of those same things happening where you have a lot of innovation, but in a decentralized organization, which the DOD is heavily decentralized. When you think about a decentralized organization, part of the reason you take a decentralized approach is to drive innovation, um, to make sure you don't have single points of failure, a number of different reasons that you have that. But ultimately, that 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 also creates this real innovation. And I love finding that. I also am surprised at moments at how far behind some of it is. So yeah. you take the good, you take them bad, you take them all, and there you have. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it, it is amazing just how big it is. I will never forget reading, I forget the name of the book. It was, it's, this has been 15 years since I read this book, but it was a book about like, uh, kind of like not, not exactly getting promoted, but just like the various levels of, of ranks in the military and the kind of mm. structure that the military has. And, um, this was somebody who was working at the Pentagon who had a very big picture view. Uh, they were probably from air force personnel command or something. And I'll never forget in the book that they were referring to one star generals. So these are people who, you know, I mean, they've they've had a career now. You know, they've been in the military right. for 25 plus years to get to the rank of one star general. You hear if you're outside the military, you think, oh, they're a general. You know, like the, this must be this massively, you know, um, impactful and important person. And this book referred to one star generals as middle managers. Like just because of the sheer because there is and it's kind of true in the sense that there's still so much above them. Right. There is still so much broader stuff above them, but still they have to be at general level because there's so much below them. Like it's just such a massive yeah. organization that it's it's kind of it's it's hard to comprehend. Um, and, and as you say, it is extremely decentralized. And I think you're right in that we, it's easy to forget about 
it's not only the like this massive organization, but it's a no fail organization, right? Like, right. you know, if if something crazy happened and Google broke tomorrow, like, I mean, it would be disruptive, but it, it it's different than if the military breaks tomorrow. Like, it's just it's just a different thing. And so I think that's where there's that give and take. I think you're right in that though it can there are there is so much that moves so slowly. That's why there is that level of um, consistency that they just have to maintain that level of structure that they have to maintain because though they want innovation, they can't let it fail either. Yeah, and and I think there there are just I mean, we deal with this all the time on the DVB as we're writing our studies. We do need to point out the differences between where public, where where the DOD lags behind private industry. And mm-hmm. you will see that as a consistent theme in the reports that we write. I also think that when you when when we write those things, we heavily debate behind closed doors um, how far to take that language because ultimately public industry, like the public sector and private industry are two different things with two different goals. Mm -hmm. Um, And ultimately, you know, in private business, we have really clear plans that we're going for. They're like, their products, their tools, their platforms. There's a three-year business strategy. Every business has to deal deal with, you know, VUCA. Like we've all got to figure out how to deal with outside influences that are kind of, kind of come in, things like COVID. That's a very different thing than the Department of Defense, yeah. where ultimately this is a, a large group of people who have to plan for every eventuality. And frankly, people like us on the outside are wanting, you know, people stand up and yell and and the press writes about things and everybody wants to hold our government accountable, which we should. That is that's how a democracy works. And also it it's not always so comparable because the problems that the military has to solve are so vast. And so uh, I, I I love this field of um, scenario planning not not strategy planning which we all know which is like we want to get to this end objective we take these steps here are the building blocks to get there but the the field of scenario planning where you plan for so many different eventualities uh when i worked with homeland security we would do tabletop exercises where you're trying to handle all of the influences those things happen you know uh, regularly within the dod as well i think the what it takes to manage all those optionalities and how to respond to those just requires a complexity. And then I think you also have, like it's worth pointing out that the way that funding works for the DOD, it's often not like, here's your strategic budget, work from it. It's more like, uh, you know, different players who allocate different money from Congress in different directions towards projects that benefit their state, et cetera. And so the DOD has to manage a lot of moving pieces here uh, that ultimately, I think, still create, give us the the best military in the world, uh, in the yeah. United States, and much to be proud of in the way that that works. Yeah, absolutely. So with, with all those caveats being said, um, are there any particular, like, what's the low-hanging fruit that you've seen? Like, was, are there things that you're, you know, you know, gaps that you've seen where the DOD is kind of behind, that they're just like, ooh, this, this could be an easy one that we could go after, you know, speaking to somebody who knows a lot of people in the DOD who are looking for improvements. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think ultimately the um, one of the biggest things that we can do, and these things exist already in DoD, but from where I sit, and again, I'm going to speak as me. This is not me speaking on behalf of the DVB, but I think um, the need for connective tissue across, and I think in in military parlance, there's the joint force, the idea of like how we approach things together. Um, I think it's very easy inside the DOD to get siloed because of yeah. the decentralized nature of things, whether it's funding, structure, authority, um, uh, legislation that guides those decisions. I think if I were going to say what's the one, you know, what's the one thing that I've seen in my time that would be most beneficial, lots of caveats, um, it really is sharing best practices of where that innovation is mm. happening across uh, functions, having stronger functional communities who are empowered to really bring best practices uh, across the entire department. Uh, and there are places where that happens. Again, there are places where uh, different commanders work more proactively or within services, et cetera. Um, we know that the Air Force does a phenomenal job of this inside the confines of the Air Force. 
uh, I think what one of the things that is the lowest hanging fruit is to be able to do a better job about talking about what's working uh, across services uh, and sharing techniques, tools, titles, uh, processes, flows, relationships with vendors, all of these things in a way that uh, allows each service and component to move more quickly uh, based on what's already been learned inside the DoD. That's the thing that jumps out to me as, as easiest lift. That's awesome. It really reminds me of, uh, have you read the book Team of Teams? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's for anybody who hasn't. It's by General Stanley McChrystal and kind of traces his time as the head of uh, Joint Special Forces Command in Iraq around 2008. And it really is a micro version of exactly of what you're talking about, where yeah. he came in and there's all these individual special forces teams. There's Army Rangers, there's Navy SEALs that are all individually excellent and doing amazing things, but they're all stepping on each other and getting in each other's way. Yeah. And it's um, it's one of my highly most rec uh, highest recommended leadership books out there because I think... Um, interestingly enough, I, I find some of the fastest paced organizations face exactly the same problem for different reasons oh, yeah. in that <laughs> they're every team is trying to move so fast that they can only focus on their objectives and it can be at the detriment to other objectives if they don't step back. Um, so a completely different reason for that siloing, but um, it's one of the biggest problems that I run into out in just regular corporate life, I think. Absolutely. I think the... They're, they're just trade-offs, right? Yeah. This is this is the trade-off between centralization, decentralization, moving fast, moving slow, risk mitigation, uh, risk aversion. You, you just see all of that. Uh, but ultimately, I think um, finding the places where they're common ground and sharing proactively, the thing is that takes time. Yeah. It takes time and energy away from the work. And so it really... You, you also do have to make real trade-offs about if that time away is worth it and what the benefits are. Uh, so yeah, I, I appreciate that question for sure. Yeah. Um, so then to look at the other side of it, you know, there's the low hanging fruit, but we've always, we've already said, you know, there's all these great things that are happening too and good things that are going on. You've seen at the smallest scale as well, you know, working with startups and other organizations like that, how, um, what do you what have you seen that you think the DoD does really well? Like, what are some or at least some lessons that you're seeing that would be well to transfer from these large organizations that other organizations might be able to learn from? Yeah, here's here's the thing about the DoD that I think is still fascinating is at the end of the day, they're they're places of innovation. Um, you know, if we think about for those who have been in L and D for a hot minute, I know you know in the world of uh, e-learning, most folks have moved on to um, XAPI and a number of things. But before SCORM, uh, before XAPI was SCORM and before SCORM was um, AICC. And AICC is a is a government protocol, yep. right? It's yep. a it's an Air Force protocol, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, if you talk about the whole field of instructional systems design itself, like the beginning of ISD, it's a military concept. So this, this world of talent development, it was the military who pioneered yep. so much of what adult education and workforce development look like, uh, essentially because you have to, um, to facilitate. And I think as much as one might wanna look at the military and look at the things that aren't always done so well, if you just reflect on, I, I would, the, the only other organizations I can think of that work like this are retail organizations where there's high turnover. The DOD is, at least in the military, is high turnover with intentionality. You, you sign up to serve for three years, four years, six years. Maybe you become a lifer in time. But ultimately, the amount of time that you sign up for is finite, which means that the whole military has to be able to train new um, service members to quickly get up to speed on the bulk of how the DOD runs year after year after year after year. And I think what the DOD really does well is like the logistics of moving massive bodies of people around the, the whole, I mean, we call them boot camps. Boot camps are all the rage, rage excuse me, Boot camps are all the rage in the private sector. That whole concept is a military yeah, concept. It is, absolutely. That is about intense, hands-on, applied, get in the dirt, learn what it means, get comfortable with it. It is your life, do it. And, and so I think when I think 
about what I see in DOD. Certainly, I see scenarios. Uh, I got to see some on my last trip even where we were looking at some of the ways that people are being trained um, and getting smarter based on scenario-based learning in digital environments. So we know those kinds of things are happening and can come out to private sector. We know that those things are also happening in private sector and being done really well. But ultimately, I think the thing that the DOD does so well that the rest of the business world isn't caught up to, doesn't do well, is this sense of when I know I'm going to have turnover, I still invest in those people. Ultimately, those uh, former service members have pride about their time uh, in DOD. They also have, they see the things that didn't work. Not, sure. I mean, not to talk about anybody on this podcast, but like they <laughs> see the things that don't work about the experience, but they walk out with a lot of pride about what they went through and ultimately become a part of a, like a much larger uh, workforce, right? You are, a, you at, when you come out of the military, you are a source of highly skilled labor that comes out into the rest of the field. And we get to benefit from in private industry. SpaceX gets to benefit from your skills and background uh, in the Air Force. So ultimately, I think when I think about what the what can we learn from DOD, it is the importance of investing in talent development. At the yeah. end of the day, like I think that the brand loyalty that exists between former service members towards their brand of Army, Air Force, uh, whatever, um, it is a it is about the investment that was made in them and the way that they feel affinity towards that brand from from their own experiences. I think companies can look at the way that the DOD invests in its service members and recognize that there is a lot of upside and loyalty from people who have had significant investments in them, move them around for opportunities. Right. This is another basic concept that's existed in the military for eons, it's definitely in the American military, that you rotate in and out. You become a deep expert in one area, but if you're going to become a leader, you've got to float around and go to a lot of different places and have exposure to different processes and tools and uh, segments and um, facilities and those things to become the well-rounded leader that you need. We don't always do such a great job of that in private industry. Uh, it's a little Darwinian, like uh, own your own development, best yeah. case scenario. You know, like here, we're giving you an e-learning library. Hope you do well, right? Uh, except for if you're a really extreme hypo, like then you get this double investment. I think service members, there's certainly the same sense of hypos that exist in that in the service sector. But uh, I, I honestly think there's so much basics where yes. the DOD has like been consistent for decades about developing good talent that we need to look at and say, man, we've, we have operationalized ourselves out of some of the most impactful ways we can develop people. Like we have managed to minimize to the smallest variable yeah. skill. Like how do we get to the one thing you need and then give you no more. And I think when you do that, you can't be surprised that there's not a lot of brand affinity and that the people aren't ready to go anywhere that you need. But if you invest in people in deep and meaningful ways, they are highly valuable to you in the future, very fungible and flexible to meet the needs of the organization. So it's honestly not the most innovative thing that's come around in the past few years that makes me excited and see the DOD as a model. It is its intentional talent development efforts year after year after year after year that raises up in a high turnover workforce the skills that are needed not just to operationalize or to operate at a positive format, to, but to be the best in the world uh, despite that high turnover because of the talent development efforts they put in place. That is, I'm so glad you you pointed that out because I, it wouldn't have been the first thing to come to my mind, but as soon as you started saying, I was like, yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, for people who are out there who have only been in the corporate world, I the thing I always bring up is, you know, imagine, you know, you're a hiring manager, you're manager of a team, and you have zero say on who shows up for your team. People just, <laughs> you don't even know when they're going to show up. Somebody just shows up on a Thursday and said, hey, I'm here, let's get to work. You know, if that was your world, 
you would need you would spend some time investing in really structured yeah. onboarding programs, training programs, because that's the world of the military, where, like you said, people move around, yeah. people show up. Commanders have next to no say in who is going to yeah. be in their unit. Um, and so as a result, there's a lot. And of your training. life is in their hands. Yes. Right. Yes. Not I mean, you you invest in them because your life is in their hands. How well you train them, depending on the job, yeah. how well you train them makes the difference between life and death for you if you are in the field. So like uh don't half ass it is yeah what i mean, I, gotta say. I mean when i was you know i'm flying the kc10 getting refueled yeah i don't even know the person who's on the other end of that boom in front of my plane i've never met yeah. them i'm just assuming that they are competent enough for us to connect our two aircraft going 500 miles per hour at 25,000 feet above the ground all on faith of oh the God. training system so yeah it's true <laughs> Wow. Uh, awesome. Well, that was that's a great way to kind of start to bring this to a close. So a couple of rapid fire questions for you. I know this one is always a tricky one, but what is one book everyone should read and why? Pat Lynchioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And I would say anything by Pat Lynchioni, read. Because yes. he, he understands leadership. It's short. It's got stories. So why do I recommend it, that reason? I mean, but the list is long. Good to great. Uh, <laughs> radical candor, like what? I mean, read it all. Crossing the chasm. Read all the books. Don't the stop books. reading. All the books. You know, it's funny because I've been going back and forth because I've been listening to a number of people who are saying how you should read less books because you should take more time to really process them and like learn about them. But there's a whole other reason to read books, and you don't have to like take every idea from every book. It's just like it becomes the ether like that's just around you when you're reading lots yeah. of these books and it's just gonna kind of make you better it's great yeah yeah for awesome. sure awesome that is a great book okay um this one might be even i mean this one depends a lot on back on what your background is but what is the right. most important skill to be successful in the world today in the business world today i feel so I, like i feel so like this question is a give me which is the most important skill to be successful in today's world is to learn. Nice. I love it. That's, like that's it. Like that's a layup. If you, if you aren't able to learn, the world has changed so much since my yeah. few years in this workforce, <laughs> 20 years. At generative AI, like the skills that we're going to need are evolving already. My team's using generative AI. We're writing all the time. We're using generative AI. We're pulling data. Y'all yep. like... You have to, it's not the generative AI you've got to know as much as it is how to learn quickly to figure out what you should learn, to find the places you want to go to learn. Yeah. Uh, and then like learning to learn is that's it. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a really good one. I highly recommend that as well. Yeah. And just the idea of practicing, getting used to this kind of stuff because change, it, I, I love the phrase. It's like, we're at a point where yes, everything is changing faster than it ever has before. And this is the slowest change will be for the rest of your life. Yes, that's it. Right, like, <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, what is, you've, you've worked with a lot of organizations. What is the most common mistake you see in organizations uh, regarding talent development? Um, see, I don't think this one's fair. I'm gonna flip it. I think okay. the biggest thing that talent development folks fail to do is to integrate themselves in the business. Like I think, Perfect. I think that I, to say it simply, I do think organizations undervalue the way that talent development organizations can help them roll out change. And uh, I think they undervalue the way that talent development can help them drive new skills into the business quickly. I think they do that because frankly, learning and talent development and my experience, experience across a number of different organizations is they're more concerned with having a seat at the table than how well they steward that seat once they get it. Yes. I, I think they're uh, on the whole, a lot of folks in L and D have the luxury of worrying about which learning technology you're using or learning methodology you're using or which, which uh, uh, philosophy you adhere to or your means of project management. I think all those things are important and doing those, there was a time I was concerned about those two. I had to get better at my craft and you have to get better at your craft. 
Also, if that is where you spend your time and energy and not how you make the business, knowing where the business is and figuring out how you can insert it yourself into it, then of course the business is not gonna leverage you the way that it needs to, because ultimately you haven't made yourself indispensable to the business. So like the number one tip I give an L&D person is where is your business going and how can you make yourself essential to that thing? And then it turns out the business isn't gonna make many mistakes about how they leverage talent development because they're gonna invite you to the right places, invite you into the change, make you the center of their future, right? That's it. Perfect. So awesome. I love it. I think that was great. Thank you. Oh man. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today, Matthew. This has been, this has been fantastic. Um, If people want to hear more from you, follow you, where where can they find you? LinkedIn.com slash in slash Matthew J. Daniel. Matthew J. Daniel. That's where you can find me. LinkedIn. Perfect. Easy enough. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure it's an easy URL, but we'll still link to it in the show notes. So um, Matthew Daniel, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked the discussion, make sure to hit like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. As a reminder, if your team is struggling keeping up with the training development demands of your organization, we want to help. Better Everyday Studios is a full service instructional design team that can help you with everything from ideation to actual content creation and delivery. Please reach out to us using the link in the episode notes below. Have a great day.